Today, guys, we are going to be jumping off of... Jumping off of... Jumping off of... Yes, yes. Hello and welcome to Jumping Off Points, the podcast where we use events in the news as jumping off points to explore wider issues about politics and culture. My name is Timber. And I'm Aiden. Good to see you, Timber. Yes, man. What are you saying? I'm good. We're recording this podcast on one of the hottest days of the year. I've got a little bit of a hangover from attending a wedding last night. Um, so I feel like we're recording this potentially under quite challenging conditions, but I'm still I'm still confident that we're going to pull it off. Because you're saying that, you've got a blue shirt on that's got like light bits and dark bits. I was thinking when you said it, are you are you sweating a bunch or is that the pattern? No, do, no, oh no, that is the pattern, but I am also sweating a bunch. <laughs> I was like, he sweated himself a whole zigzag pattern onto his shirt. <laughs> this guy is so hot. I can't believe he's going to, about to jump into this podcast with me. So, over the month of August, we picked up on a trend of articles coming in from different broadsheet newspapers, Guardian, Telegraph, uh, The Times, which all talked about the recent data released in the UK from the um, National Population Survey, which said that we had the lowest birth rates um, in the last year that we'd seen since 2002. And that is going to be today's jumping off point. The declining birth rate in the UK. So on the back of that jumping off point, we'll have a look at why the birth rate is declining, the kind of the causes for that, the consequences of it, who is bothered by this falling birth rate, and that will lead us nicely onto a bit of chat about white nationalism. Okay, so the data was released by the ONS. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about what the report said? Sure, so basically what was reported widely Um, was that there were 605,000 live births in England and Wales in 2022. And that was down 3.1% from the year before. And as we said on the way in, the lowest number we've seen as a country since 2002. So over like two decades ago. Um, And around that time, we had a really low number of 600,000 births. Um, So going back even further than that, the next low point we saw was in 1977. From what you've said there, it kind of sounds like there are peaks and troughs in terms of the birth rate. And like from 1977, when there was a low point, Mm. do we know what the kind of trend has been since then? Are we looking at it continuously going down for like, say, 100 years? So this is the issue. Yeah. So the birth rate was the highest it's ever been in the UK in the 1800s when we're going through our industrial revolution. It was then very high again in the 1950s, what is uh, referred to as the baby boom which is when everyone came back from the war, had loads of babies, but that were needed to replace all the people we lost. But there's a general replacement rate, or what we call the replacement rate, which means the amount of babies everyone needs to have in order to sustain the current level of economic activity of the country. And it's basically replacing the people that you've currently got in the country. um, Working. Increasing the GDP by working. Yeah. It has been below replacement level for a really, really long time. We've had a bad year, not in comparison to a really peak year. We've had a bad year just in a long line of bad years. Yeah. The birth rate is just going down and down and down and down. Yeah. I think you've kind of touched on some of the impact that this has in in what you just said there. But there are certain people who are very concerned about this. The Times revealed earlier this week that only half of Generation Z and millennials plan to start families. This is a real crisis and not one that is invented, but people aren't fretting about it as much as climate change. What what we face uh, is population collapse. Collapse. Like people have no idea how fast the population is going to collapse. To be fair, there are potential consequences associated with an economy having a falling birth rate. The economy has an increased share of retired people who obviously suck up public money because they take in pensions and they're more likely to use uh, the NHS. So we're paying for healthcare and et cetera. Also suck up my space in the middle of the shopping aisle after work, which is like, you've got no reason to be there. You could have gone at like 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 11 (laughs) a.m. All of this is just your retirement time. Why are you coming at like six or seven when I'm trying to do my shopping? Tim, I'm concerned that you might have bring in a slightly personal grievance there that it's not necessarily relevant to the topic, but I'll I'll give you I'll give you one free pass and we'll we'll allow that one. Every time I every time I like it's about time you guys got replaced by new babies, but that's not <laughs> gonna happen with the current trend. So yeah, yeah. You need young people working in order to pay the taxes that fund those pensions and the healthcare and stuff. So basically puts pressure on government budgets when you have 
an older population that isn't being replaced by younger workers. So why is the birth rate falling? What are you doing to sort it out, Tim? Nothing. Nothing. You're childless. Yeah, I know, I know. And I've, I actually, uh, in my younger years, didn't really have much unprotected sex either. So there's not much chance of any even accidental birth rate increases from me. You're know, the reason that our economy is tanking, mate. You know, when you've got, you've got a girl and you're like, you're chirps in and you go, you go, go to the cabinet to get out a condom. Jacob Rees-Mogg comes in through the door. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> what about the replacement rate? <laughs> Are you going to put that on? Think again. We need more children. I've done my bit by having six. So now let me encourage you to do yours. The more children, the merrier. Boris Johnson's had a lot of babies as well. I reckon, I reckon he's probably done a bit. People always say that he's got more babies than he admits to as well. Like he's got secret babies. The Conservative Party, at least if they preach it, they are practicing it and just like going out and sowing their wild oats like all over the place. So what are the reasons behind the falling birth rate? In the U- I mean, let's start with the UK specifically. There's a YouGov poll that I had a look at. So in 2019, YouGov surveyed just over 2,000 adults about the prospect of having children. About 300 of them said they would never want to have kids. Only a small portion of that group, in my opinion, were of the kind of age bracket where you would expect them to have kids in the future. Mm. So anyway, that's kind of not important. A statistical point. It's a quite a small group is what I'm saying. But yeah. the most common reasons they gave were the cost is too high. I don't want the impact on my lifestyle. I don't like children. I think the world is overpopulated. I would love to have a further breakdown of that. That, that last point is, is absolutely batshit crazy. The world is overpopulated. It's like the opposite problem to the one we have. They've obviously got that from somewhere. I don't know. I think I do understand it because I remember as a kid, there being a lot of noise about how rapidly the world's population was expanding. And it was like, being reported mm. as if this was kind of going to be a strain on the world's resources. And I kind of see the link between that and the kind of our environmental issue of the more humans there are, the more resources are needed, and the more like emissions that will be released because of burning fossil fuels for the lifestyle of these new people. There was a whole movement in the mid-1900s, the fact that overpopulation was going to drive us to the point of overcompetition for resources. But it now doesn't really have a basis to stand on. Yeah. The the other reason I can see is because housing is such a big issue for young people. And they see it as, you know, they could link it to the housing problem. Though that is resolvable through building more houses. And that's always been the case. Yeah. But to be fair, I suppose, not by the individual people who are responding to the survey, right? As one person, you don't have a lot of power to bring about new house building. And successive governments have failed on it. Obviously, surveys, they're not surveying like people who have like researched into the field are they it's like general no. general conceptions about what's the idea of having children what's it going to do to the world perception of these issues is way more important than the reality yeah i don't want to share my ps4 controller with some little me <laughs> you kidding? kidding that was the i don't want to impact on my lifestyle <laughs> yeah, yeah that's true <laughs> i don't want my living room to be overpopulated that was that point as well it's all of them and i don't like children that fits in there nice. I, don't want my, I don't want my bed in the morning to be overpopulated with like two little fucking disease bags crawling in there taking up the center space leaving me to be an edge guy while my wife tells me to leave the kids alone and they need their their loving mum now in the time where they've pissed the bed or something jesus christ tim i told you i was going to give you one personal grievance issue <laughs> <laughs> you've crossed the line my friend <laughs> kids suck <laughs> our word kids yeah, so I think I think you gathered some stats on this as well, Aiden. Do you want to throw those out just to illuminate that point around cost, impact to lifestyle, all that stuff? Cost and housing, like you mentioned, are really big factors in this. So the average amount of money spent on raising a child from birth to 18 years old in the UK in 2023 is £223,000, which works out at £12,400 a year or just over £1,000 a month, which is when I think about my monthly budget, a huge amount of money. Most couples, both of them work, right? We're not, we're not in the 1950s anymore where the wife stays at home. We now have two people in the couple working, which means that you need someone to look after the kid while you're at work all day. And that costs approximately £270 a week. It's like insane. I can't imagine spending £270 a week on anything. You know, what I find joke about them pictures of the 50s is like uh, the woman has like made the meal and she's got a pudding. And then the pudding is a big bowl of jelly. <laughs> Honey, this is, this is fantastic. This is a big bowl of jelly. Can't wait to slurp this with my guests. 
Jelly was probably cutting edge technology. I, back yeah, yeah, because they had them, they had them molds as well that were like shaped like a rabbit. So you put a jelly on a ray and it's a jelly rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> and the husband is like, "Honey, you've outdone yourself. You are a culinary goddess. Well done, honey. This was worth your time while I was at work. This must have taken you all afternoon to pull off this." The husband is completely in awe because he doesn't know about the rabbit mold. He's like, how has she shaped the jelly exactly? I don't get involved in kitchen affairs. I don't know how she's done this. He thinks she's carving it with a scalpel. <laughs> <laughs> like goes to his gentleman's club smoking a stick. He's like, I don't know how they do it. They surely have some talent. Yeah, work and the pub only for the 50s men. It was a good time. So the point you mentioned there about the cost of kids. This really ties into the dilemma people face about having kids that's different to in poorer countries. So as we know on the macro scale, the countries now that are having their baby boom are sub-Saharan African countries, right? Niger being the top of the list. The people who were having the most babies in the 1900s were Chinese people and they were going through their industrial revolution. Um, the people who were having the most babies in the 1800s were the UK and America and people going through their industrial revolution. The whole issue here about the cost of kids is that we don't just have kids and pay for them to survive now. We expect something of them. And it's known that there's a cost attached to the kids becoming adults as well. Now, in developing countries, that's not the case. You have the kid, you keep it alive, it goes to the factory, it becomes an income earner for your family. Or it goes to work on the farm, becomes an income earner for your family. Now you have the kid, you send it to school, you send it to university, and all the while, the cost is just going up. It gets more expensive, not cheaper. You're not going to be able to just make that kid survive and send it off to be an engineer at Boeing. If you've got aspirations for your kid to become something more, you're going to need to be pumping quite a lot of money into them all the way through. And that's, that's, the big, that, that's what makes it a difficult choice. Completely true. We should bring back the uh, child labor. Now that I'm past the age of having to do child labor, I think we can bring yeah, it back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then also, when I get past the uh, age of 40, bring back military service for people under 40. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Makes sense. Makes perfect sense. So beyond the kind of direct cost of having a child, there's the fact that life is just very expensive now, even before you have a child. So young people now are much less likely to own a home than previous generations were. And this might seem kind of old-fashioned, but I do think that owning a home gives you a kind of stability that you that most people look for before they have a child or yeah, like a lot of people in the middle class do. If you don't have a child, it's easier to get a mortgage than it is when you have a child. So if you plan to do both, it makes sense to buy a house first. And because it's more expensive to buy a house, it's going to take you a lot longer to, to build up your deposit fund and whatever. So people buy houses a lot later. And that means that they are going to have kids a lot later as well. And a lot of young people are living in shared housing. There's been a 400% increase in the last decade of people living in shared accommodation. Again, might seem old fashioned, but I just think it's more difficult to raise a child if you're living in a room in a shared house rather than a, in your own home. So this is what I came across in your notes that surprised me. Everything the data shows is that poor people have babies more often. They have babies earlier. And yet then I read through your notes and you're like, one of the biggest problems is cost. And it's, that, there's a contradiction because it's like, well, for people who are having babies the most, it seems like cost really isn't the, the main deciding factor. Whereas people who have more money to start off with, cost mm. is a bigger factor. Like, whereas we look at the poorest countries, they're having the most babies. The richest countries are having the least babies and saying cost is the reason. Cost means a very different thing. Say if you're someone who's earning minimum wage, right? The amount of money that you'll probably get if you sign on is probably comparable, right? Yes. Yeah, Whereas yeah. if you're someone who's like got career aspirations and earning a higher salary, the cost of taking a lot of time off work and putting your kid into childcare is all stuff that you can't that you have to take into account of time when you wouldn't be earning what you would be earning anyway. So your lifestyle takes a big dip. Mm. Well, this is this is the other I think macro point is it comes down to people, people's choice. And that is, the, that is the biggest issue that we face here, is that we can acknowledge the GDP going down is a bad thing. We can acknowledge that it's bad having like kids below replacement level. But the other side of that coin is, it's also bad to force women to be baby factories. That is kind of like the alternative that sort of slipped under the rug if we ever have this conversation with someone who's very far right conservative and wants to return back to tradition. Yeah, feminism is, and I'm not saying this as a criticism of feminism, but it's definitely a massive part of this. Mm. 
now more socially acceptable for women to choose a life without children, I think, and more acceptable for them to wait a lot longer before deciding to have children. And that means that the age at which a woman has her first child has gone up. So it's now in the UK, the average age a woman has the first child is just over 30 years old, which Mm. is also when fertility in women starts to decline. It possibly means that some people, because they're choosing to have a child later, are not able to because they've already become less fertile than they would have been, say, 10 years ago. Yes. So around the world at the moment, there's a pro-natalist movement um, composed of these people who have far-right politics and are trying to... Basically, they're trying to make the native population have more babies. Yeah. And white nationalists have this strain of thought now that's like, we have to encourage um, more births from people that we see as being worthy who are, you know, white Britons. Yeah. And the solution they're prepared to say out loud is that we need to be encouraging this through uh, sort of tax dividends, income bonuses, all these things. So we've seen it recently in Poland. We've seen it in Hungary, both quite far right leaning governments. Uh, Hungary to a larger extent than Poland, but still coming from a similar place. Poland, they've got the Family 500 program. Um, It's a child benefit that means that people get an extraordinary amount per child. And Hungary, so they've got a kind of similar policy, but it comes as a tax dividend. And so, you know, they've got those policies in these countries because they're trying to encourage those native people to do it. Yeah. Now, it hasn't worked. They saw a very, very brief uptick in the amount of people having babies when they first launched these policies. So, you know, the mid 2010s, people were waiting to see how it would go. By uh, 2020, those small benefits have tailed off. So despite pouring all of their money into these causes, Poland's birth rate is nowhere near the birth rate of France, who hasn't massively diverted all the funds in their economy to that aim. The policies are not working. You could argue maybe they've slowed the decrease. They've slowed a decline but that decline is still happening. Mm. And to tie it back into what we were saying before, the reason is these are wealthy women who they're trying to encourage to have more babies. When you're a wealthy woman, you know, your, your, your country giving you one or 200 pounds more is not the kind of money that's going to make you change your whole outlook on what you want to do with your life. You've got more to live for. Yeah. You probably, as a person, you aspire to a lot more than just being a baby factory and having like a little unit of kids who you, you raise, you know? Yeah. And these people, it's not even necessarily they're choosing to have no babies. They might choose to have one child because that fits in really well. We could take our little Benny on holiday with us. He fits in with what we do. Rather than having a family with three children. Yes. Where the kids take over and you've got to play zone defense on holiday to like, who's, who's, (laughs) who's fucking up, who's fucking up the holiday vibe now. (laughs) Zone defense is so good. You've got to wrangle little Timmy back into his corner. (laughs) A lot of women just don't want to have kids. Because they don't want to have kids. And they're, and they're getting their life fulfillment from their job and from their other social networks and stuff. I think we've kind of moved past the idea that you must have a child in order to have a happy life. So I think while money is obviously a factor, it's not the only thing you'd have to fix. This thing about we need a replacement birth rate in order to look after our aging population, in order to enter the job market, in order to fulfill those innovative roles that young people tend to go into. People having more babies isn't the only way of achieving those things, right? Yeah, you can just import that stuff, you know? Get it from abroad. And that's literally what has been happening. So UK, since the 1950s, 1960s, has had an immigration program that looks to fill gaps in our labor pool So with that tailing off that we've seen of the replacement birth rate, it doesn't mean that there's a complete gap in our young generations where the care homes are empty because there's no one to look after your grandma. There are people in those care homes and they're probably Nigerian, right? When my mum had bipolar for that time, when she had a manic episode, all of the carers coming around to my house were people who were foreign born, people who'd come to move here and filled gaps in the care system. And are doing really important jobs. We need them. We need those people to come. If I'd had to be around my mum during that time and I couldn't power her off on some Nigerians, I would have been really sad. <laughs> she was a disaster. Um, glad to hear that she's doing better now. Though, <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's very tolerable now, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so obviously that level of immigration, whilst completely inevitable, is not popular with certain parts of society. And that leads to 
conspiracy theory thinking from some parts of the far right. We've got to stop the flow across the Mediterranean. Uh, and, and if we allow it to continue, uh, we will actually, through our compassion, imperil the future of our civilization. And what that conspiracy theory is called is great replacement theory, which is basically the idea that the UK's or kind of white people in the West, their falling birth rate and high immigration of people from particularly Muslim countries is a plot to replace white people and white culture. Yeah, and, that, and I think the important thing is, is you take this conspiracy theory seriously, it's that the Jews are orchestrating it, or Jewish powerful people. You know the names, Klaus Schwab, um, George Soros, anyone who is uh, a sort of like billionaire philanthropist is in some way, if not openly Jewish, then secretly Jewish, and they are paying money for this to happen. I think this is a really sticky topic, because it's one of those conspiracy theories, quote unquote, there's something that is happening that this theory accurately describes, which is immigration is happening, right? You're going to see more immigrants in your country now versus 10 years ago versus 20 years before that versus 30 years before that versus 40 years before that. You can't deny that, right? And so when people say, well, oh yeah, more brown people are going to be here replacing white people. So if you take it on its face, yeah, literally, if you look around a pub where before you might have seen a room full of white people, you might now see four brown people as well. And, yeah. you know, they have been, you know, over 40 years, those people who might have been white have been replaced by people with different colored skin. I think the conspiracy component and what tilts it into a conspiracy theory from observing something that is obvious to something that is very nefarious and dangerous is that is this idea that it's been plotted on purpose to get rid of your culture it's not just a phenomenon that's happening where these people are moving here and they're going to they're going to coexist with you it's the fact they are sent here purposefully to wipe your culture out yeah to invade because if you've got if you've got that mentality towards it you invest in this conspiracy theory to the, to its nth degree there is then a reason to take up arms, to commit acts of violence, because it puts you in a box where what else can you do? If that's the conspiracy and it's being driven by rich people who you can never touch and you can't stop it in any other way, that's where it becomes a dangerous thing to believe in. Which is ridiculous because no child of an immigrant or no black or brown person that I've ever met has ever tried to pers dissuade me from going to the pub. Or no enjoying a lovely fish and chips. You know what I mean? Goldie persuaded me to listen to drum and bass. Which and is I was like, Why quintessentially not? UK. You know what I mean? That's quintessentially <laughs> British pastime listening to drum and bass. Why not some sort of uh, music from wherever your grandparents came from? Well, I don't know what, know what they listen to, but why not that? Why Why this new newfangled white people music, you know, that you made when you moved over to the UK? Aidan found this piece, uh, researched by King's College London, that revealed that 32% of the people in the UK believe in the Great Replacement Theory, which I just thought was um, insanely high. Astonishingly high, yeah. But then I delved further into that research, and um, what I found was it's, it's the exact thing that I was describing. They're not quite all the way there with saying that it's a plot, but they are there in terms of saying it's true that white people are being replaced. Yeah, this is the way the question was posed to these people. Um, so it's a list of questions, and it, and it asks them, is this statement true or false? The Great Replacement Theory, the idea that white Americans and Europeans are being replaced by non-white immigrants, is happening. The thing is, there's going to be such a minority within a minority that would have gone online, read into this conspiracy theory and fully... But it's No, it's not going to be 32% of people in England who, who, who are in the bowels of 4chan reading about those conspiracy theories. In the results, 12% of people said it was definitely true, and 20% of people said, oh, it's probably true. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's not 32% of people being like invested in the great replacement theory. No, but, but I still think 12% 12 of people saying it's definitely true is still alarmingly high. high. Yeah. And, and I would say that even if you're not someone who's like hyper online and really engaged with this conspiracy theory, you are presented with a lot of media that will basically make you worry about this exact situation. 
if you spend 10 minutes looking for it, you can find countless articles from the Daily Mail, the Telegraph, the Spectator, raising the alarm about how the number of white people as a share of the population of, U- of the UK is dwindling. So I guess even if the 32% of people aren't all conspiracy nuts, I would suggest that a lot of them are racist. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So there's a piece that Aidan found in the Spectre. As you might be aware, Aidan was in charge of our Great Replacement Theory research for this episode. (laughs) I was the most disgusting hour of reading of my life. I was just like, I was like reading these articles and I was like, I cannot believe that has been published in a newspaper. It is insane how bad it is. Yeah. So like, for example, this Spectator one that you're about to reference before I had to cut in there. It's written by Lionel Shriver, who's the author of We Need to Talk About Kevin. She is actually quite a well-respected person in literary circles. That's like, that was a massive book. And I was actually really surprised that this was posted in The Spectator. This, for reasons we'll go into, this really toes that line. And actually, I would say steps over it into, into pure racism. Oh, yeah, it's disgusting. So she's talking about this exact point of white British-born people becoming a smaller share of the overall population. And the things she says about it are wild. She says, for Westerners to passively accept and even abet incursions by foreigners so massive that the native born are effectively surrendering their territory without a shot fired is biologically perverse. She says, it is socially and even biologically unnatural for Brits to accept that the proportion of white British people in the UK is falling. So then she lists a whole load of stats that she's got from Migration Watch, basically. Migration Watch is a anti-immigration think tank, essentially, who takes the the reports that come out from government bodies. From what I've looked into, the stats they post are true, right? Migration Watch. But it's the way these things are presented. And Lionel's article does a really good job of showing this. So one of the things uh, Lionel pulls out of a Migration Watch study is uh, the white British proportion of the population has fallen from 89% to 79%, while ethnic minorities have grown from 10% to 21%. Now what I, so this is what I get from that sentence when I hear that. White British proportion of the population. Who am I thinking of? I'm thinking of me. I'm thinking of you. (laughs) I'm thinking of uh, sort of white British, just anyone who's white and lives in, I'm thinking of whites, right? That's what I'm thinking of. And then when she says ethnic minorities, I'm thinking of refugees. I'm thinking of asylum seekers. I'm thinking of very, very poor people who've moved recently from other countries, don't speak the language. That's the image painted by this. And I'm thinking, so this is what, 21% of our country is those, that second group that I've mentioned. And 79% of our country is that first group that I mentioned. Now, I then went, so I was was contemplating how deep to go into this. And I thought, you know, what I'll actually do is I'll look at the exact migration watch report that she is going from. So basically what I found is the questionnaire that they use to send out to people, and this is how they get these statistics. They send this questionnaire out to households and individuals, and they ask that individual and that household, what is your ethnic group? Choose one section, right? Choose one option. So your ethnic group could be white, and there's different categories of white. Your ethnic group could be mixed. So things like white and black Caribbean, white and Asian. Asian, which is like Indian, Pakistani, black, or black British, so Caribbean, African background. And it's, it's people marking themselves. What is your ethnicity? So what are your parents? And what occurred to me was me filling out this questionnaire. I'm half Indian. My dad comes from India. He's fully Indian. I would be ticking mixed white and Asian. And then in in the world of Migration Watch UK, I'm one of the 21% of ethnic minorities in the UK. You're basically live on the recording of the podcast, realizing that Nigel Farage would not want you to be in the UK. <laughs> no, but that's, that's what I'm saying. It's like, I think th- there's, there's a disingenuousness to how this is presented. So first of all, there's things that are just on their face, just seem completely misleading in the way that Lionel Shriver has presented. Because So when we talk about, she talks about white British people and ethnic minorities as a separate group, 6.5% of the 21% of ethnic minorities are people who mark themselves as white other. Now this is Polish people, German people, Italian people, Portuguese people, Australian, Spanish, Greek, Hungarian, Turkish. Like these are people who you go to your pub 
you look around, it's a group of white people. There's ethnic minorities in there and they're fucking Polish. <laughs> <laughs> right? So it just like automatically, I'm like, well, this is complete. The way she's framed it is so misleading because she doesn't make any allusion to the fact that 6.5% of them are just other white people. Um, 3.4% are black British. Like, you know, that could be, so that would be Ian Wright. It would be Goldie. It would be Wiley. It would be people who've been like staples of this country. Of UK culture. Of UK culture for like 20 years. For like yeah. 30 years. They're ethnic minorities. Um, and so, you know, I don't, I don't at all object to the government collecting that data. I think it's really good to be able to see the ethnic composition, where people have come from, like who are they in our country and like how many. Yeah. But the problem is it then gives these far right think tanks and Lionel Shriver a window to come in and tell people information that is, I would say, so misleading that yeah. it is false. It's, it's an oversimplification of what is essentially a very nuanced data set mm. in order to make a point that white people and white culture is being eroded. And she's, and she's like, the point that she comes down to is people are right to feel bad about their country getting taken over or their country being dissipated by ethnic minorities. And it's like, well, Rishi Sunak is an ethnic minority by the ONS data. Would anyone accuse Rishi Sunak of taking over British culture? He's like, he's the prime minister. They definitely would. Like, they de- like, like It's the dumbest thing ever, but racist people would definitely say. That's what I mean. Pretty Patel. Part yeah. of this ethnic minority wave taking over British culture. <laughs> Lisa Nandy. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, oh, Pretty Patel. She's coming over here. She's stealing our racism that's supposed to be <laughs> our thing. I know. <laughs> I know. It's like that to me is just so fucking dishonest. That is like, you know, to say that, oh, there's 21% of them. And like, and then, oh, and the big, how many of those are fucking Rishi Sunaks who yeah. are like, you know, they're perpetuating what I would describe as the most conservative aspects of British culture. Of British nationalism. Of British, yeah. British nationalism and stuff that really like, you know, it's, it's anti-immigration, if anything. So sure, it's true that the proportion of white British people of the population is falling. Mm. What these people don't do is say why that's bad. Like they don't say, what is it about brown people that can't be British culture? And this is what I see as an issue is people like me, who put ourselves in the a- white and Asian, white and black, white and... That category is going to get bigger and bigger. Yeah. Because immigrants are fucking paying and we like to start relationships with them, right? <laughs> <laughs> and they're much better at having children than... <laughs> they are much better. Than white British people are. Like, there's going to be more and more people ticking that box as time goes on. And yet these people are going to look more and more what could be described as white, right? Pale. For anyone who's listening to the podcast doesn't know what I look like. I am the palest light-skinned breader you've ever met. Like you, you just would look at me and be like, this guy has got the fairest skin. He's going to get burnt in the sun after like two minutes of sitting out there. My integration into UK culture was a done deal from birth because I've got <laughs> Northern mum and my dad was raised in Blackburn, right? There's going to be more of me as time goes on. And that is going to be portrayed as a statistic of like, oh, well, now there's 40% ethnic minorities, but it's loads of fucking white people, you know, or, or fair skinned, like slightly tanned white people, because there's, it's, just, it's just people having relationships with like, you know, people who come from like African parents or whatever. It's like, I think that is, that's the problem. They're portraying this as your culture is going to go. But then are you telling me like Ian Wright is like, you know, he's eroding British culture by being a football commentator that everyone quite likes. Is he, is he part of this erosion? The arguments fall apart really fast, don't they? Because it's also like, like, we, like we've said earlier, the immigration is essential. Yeah. If you actually wanted to stop this process happening, mm. the first thing you'd have to do is stop immigration, right? Unless you're going to go full fascist authoritarian. You can't stop people having babies with people that are legally allowed to be here who they would fall in love with. So mm. you'd have to immediately stop all immigration. But we need that immigration in order to keep the country running. Mm. So there's there's no solution to this to this problem that they've invented. It's just it's just something to complain about. The, the the under the carpet solution, and this is the problem. The under the carpet solution is mandatory baby policies for women. You're mandated to get into a relationship early. You're mandated to be the household wife. You're mandated you baby making quotas. Mm. That is the that is the like it's it's horrible. That's how you make white women have more babies. That's how you make white middle class people have more babies. Force them. Straight up fascism, isn't it? But obviously that's not going to be what they come in the door with, is it? It's going <laughs> to be... It's not going to be a vote winner, is it? Let's no, go. not at all. Even at the point that white British people, quote unquote, 
cease to be a majority, they will still be a majority. They'll still be the largest group. They'll still be the largest group by such a long way. There's 80% now, right? And even more if you count the whites who are Polish. In the future, it's the fact that you've had Bangladeshi people move in. You've had people from like African countries move in. You've had people from Pakistan move in. These people are not joining together to make a monolithic culture of their own to fight the white (laughs) culture. They're having their own. There's no way they're taking out white culture. There's just not enough. They're not on the same page. Hint. Hindus and Muslims hate each other, right? <laughs> and also, inevitably, after you m- live in a new place for a certain amount of time, you start adopting the native culture anyway. Like, I'm sure your dad is very much enjoys a lot of the British culture, even though he was born in India, right? Fucking loves Radiohead. I mean, it's weird in that sense, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. A little, little bit of context the listeners don't know. Aiden hates Radiohead without, without any reason. Once I fucking played him a Radiohead tune without telling it was Radiohead. And I was like, oh, what do you think of this? He was like, oh, it's pretty good. Told him it was Radiohead and he just shifted his opinion like a wheezy little <laughs> stoat. Turning on a dime. As, as soon as I heard that I was Radiohead, it started to sound disgusting in my this, ears. This guy. It was, like, it was like, you know, it started off fairly okay. But then as soon as I knew there was Tom York was behind it, I was like, oh. This guy is like a high school chick who bases it off like just <laughs> trying to be cool. He wants to be the cool girl who hates Radiohead. Well, and he's just like basing <laughs> all of his opinions off that. Can you believe it? It's weakness. You're saying, you're saying that though, but literally every friendship group I have, I get so much flack for not liking Radiohead. It's good, like, good. It would, it would be it would be a terrible plan in order to seem cool and make friends because it just gets me loads of grief everywhere I go. It's like for you, the great replacement is people who don't like Radiohead being replaced <laughs> by correct people. That's the true great replacement. Yeah, your dad's really let me down with that one. Well, fair. yeah. He's <laughs> coming from another country and loved Radiohead as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's that's the whole thing. It's like you're and I think about the areas that these I mean, all of the so for example, the black British population overwhelmingly are in London, right? If you if you're the kind of person that doesn't like living in a multicultural sort of cosmopolitan area. London's not for you. It seems to me they're like, why has London become this way? And they're people looking at London from the outside. They haven't lived in London or haven't lived there for like over 20 years or something. Right? This is a disgrace. I would never have liked to. It's like, well, there's a reason you probably moved to somewhere like Somerset where yeah. everyone's white. and <laughs> Everyone's going to be white or a Rishi Sunak Indian, right? There's no, there's not, no, no one's going to change the culture of Somerset, right? I, yeah. And, and I also think what you're saying about obviously there being a higher percentage of black British people in London, I think it shows how much British culture has benefited from that. When you look at our massive cultural export of rap music, for example. Our biggest cultural export is drum and bass, jungle, garage, like- Drill, grime, you know, like- Yeah. And and all of that, to me, is really very British. You know, you you play that stuff to American people and they just don't get it. But it's, it's very British, but it's not made by white people. And that's okay. And not only that, them Jamaicans who came over didn't make that music in Jamaica. Mm. They came to England, heard like, you know, the the breaks, acid house, blah, blah, all that stuff. And then they were like, oh, it's like fucking reggaeton vocals, yardy flow, fast break beats. You know, they wouldn't have made that in Jamaica. I'm telling you. <laughs> they made something being specifically from that ethnic background, but that they wouldn't have made had they not traveled to another country and like heard the shit here. And I think, I think this is basically the issue of this great replacement theory thing is that People who, who buy into it are trying to protect something that already has changed, taken influence and changed on the basis of immigration. And mm. to me, that's a wonderful thing. But you can't now say it needs to stay exactly like this because we don't want any more immigration. It's like, well, you've already you're already you're already enjoying imported foods every week. Like what British mm. person doesn't like a curry? And I know like there is a line, right? If it's a Muslim heavy area and they're like, no more scantily dressed women. No, like everyone's got to be modestly dressed. There's no more drinking. There's the line. Uh, if they're imposing a culture on us, on me, I'd be fucking furious. Mm. When people talk about these, these areas of like densely populated with people who like they have their own communes and stuff. No, I'm saying go in there, break that apart, find a way in our immigration system to integrate people better into British life, British cultures. If they come here, you respect our laws, you respect liberal values, all that shit. Totally yeah. on board with that. But it's it's the idea that culture that's white and Br- the white and British kind is going. No, it's going to change and be reflected by a new culture, which your kids 
will then look at as the new white British culture. And they might not want that to be changed when they're old, but then it'll change. And then their kids will have a new white British culture, which they all want to defend. And so the cycle continues, right? Yeah. And I, and I always think the fear over people from Muslim countries not integrating well is so overhyped. Like I live in North London in an area where there are a lot of Muslim people. And I, I've honestly never, I've never encountered that being any kind of imposition on the way that I like to live my life. Well, Leeds Hyde Park, right? In Leeds, the biggest student centric area which is where everyone is like <laughs> taking <laughs> taking class A drugs up all night, drinking all the time, uh, taking like seven trips to Tesco Express to buy like eight packs of uh, Stella Artois. This is the most Muslim heavy area in Leeds and the most student heavy area. Yeah. For some reason, that seems to be <laughs> working fine. <laughs> the, two, the two groups live together the two groups, in like, perfect harmony. harmony. Yeah. The girls are wearing like fucking bikinis walking around the streets, you know, uh, coming back from one night stands. I can tell you, it's, it's, fucking, it's, it's fucking crazy in Hyde Park. Now as an adult, even more. Going back <laughs> if anything, you're more conservative than everyone got, else. <laughs> you've got Muslims dressed up in like full, full burqas walking around. And they're just, you know. Yeah. And do and you know what? So Muslim people are very often the people I see running food banks and supporting the wider community for people that aren't not, like you don't even have to be Muslim to be someone that benefits from the good that they do in the local community. So I, I just think I think people who live in diverse areas are much less susceptible to this idea that your culture is going to be overrun or ruined that's 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 the whole point though because it's people worrying about losing something you're in like a little village you like going to the pub on fridays that's you're gonna lose that you know if, if immigrants come and overrun this area it's the threat of if, if it's happened once it's happened they're here oh i'm fine you've got nothing to be scared about and that's how people in london probably feel at this point it's like well oh the ethnic mix is going to get a little bit more ethnic i mean my life's probably going to be the same it's already pretty ethnic <laughs> Whereas if, if the ethnic mix is very small, yeah. suddenly you feel like you've got something to lose. Yeah. And I suppose you, you are the only person who might notice a change. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. it. Um, and this, and this, I think this is probably a good point to, to, to end as well. This is, this is the sentence from the article that I think really pulls out the fact that this is not about culture. This is about race. Um, and this, so again, Lionel Sh is it Shriver or Shriver? Anyway, um, she said, so this is a sentence she says in her article. White Britons needn't submissively accept the drastic ethnic and religious transformation of their country as an inevitable fate they're morally required to embrace without a peep of a protest. This is where I think, you know, because we can say about culture, and I don't think that's racist. I think you being worried about your culture being wiped out, I don't think that's necessarily racist. It's, it's unfounded, but it, it, if it genuinely happened, I think you'd be within your rights to be annoyed about it. Drinking is our culture. Drum and bass music is our culture. These th I would be fucking pissed off if I lost those things due to immigrants arriving. Mm. No question about it. But look at the words she's using here. White Britons. So first of all, going into this, who shouldn't needlessly accept this? White Britons. So we're not talking about the black Britons like Ian Wright. We're not talking about the Indian Britons, like Rishi Sunak, we're talking about those Britons who are white. And then she says, they don't need to submissively accept the drastic ethnic transformation of their country. And this, this for me, blows the whole thing apart because the ethnic transformation of our country is people like Priti Patel being leaders of the Conservative Party. That's part of the ethnic transformation of our country. Mm. Is people like Wiley being here and making subgenres of music that then take over the world? Stormzy, who's a huge Stormzy, export. massive cultural export to the US. They're not taking away our culture at all. They're they're furthering our culture abroad and domestically. It. Yeah, they're creating true. it. Yeah, but they are ethnically changing our country. Mm. And for me, if you're making the argument, so when you're saying about an ethnic transformation and you're saying we don't need to submissively accept that, that's inherently an argument for less people like Rishi Sunak, Priti Patel, Sajid Javid. You're saying we need less of them. And I don't mm. know how you, because these people are purely conservative, there's no reason for you to disagree along ideological lines with these people. You, at that point, the argument is funneled down to race. Mm. 
it's a racist point. There's no two ways about it, in my view, at that point. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Very poignant end to the podcast. Normally, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> normally, normally I like to say something a bit silly at the end, but I can't. Super yeah. Shit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thanks for listening to another episode of Jumping Off Points. That's been a real fun ride through the falling birth rates right into, I feel like we did a lot of racism discussion, which I wasn't expecting, but interesting. Racism is inherently interesting, isn't it? And I'm thinking of thumbnails right now for this because of the broad array of topics we've covered. I might have like some sort of white baby being slam dunked to the floor through a basketball hoop or something. <laughs> kidding, kidding. <laughs> Guys, just kidding. It's a little joke. <laughs> My God. Okay, good. So thanks. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Appreciate having you. We really enjoy doing these podcasts. We really enjoy that you listen to them. Um, we will release one as soon as uh, the next jumping off point Yahoo! lands. Um, so uh, it's a bye from me. And it's bye bye from me too. Bye. bye, 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 bye. Jumping off the...